Hello, I'm Devin, and you're listening to Tools and Craft. Today, I'm talking with Danielle Baskin. Danielle is hard to sum up in one title, which is one of the reasons I'm so excited to have her on the show. She builds companies as performance art and also runs them as effective businesses. She runs weird events, like a conference that takes place while waiting in lines. She runs factories to make things like branded fruit and painted helmets and so much more. She also co-founded Dial Up, a voice-based social network that connects friends serendipitously in phone calls. The best title I've been able to come up with to describe the work that she does is Situation Designer. And after this conversation, you'll be able to decide for yourself if it fits. So Danielle, thank you so much for taking the time to chat. Thanks for having me. I like the phrase situation designer. A lot of the things that you've built bridge the gap between the digital and the physical. For example, your Face ID Masks company, which I didn't even mention in the intro, where you can order a respirator mask with your face printed on it, or your branded fruit company that puts logos on fruit. And I have to admit that I've personally always been pretty intimidated by the prospect of moving from bits to atoms. I've always done software and not quote unquote real engineering, real manufacturing. I don't think that that outlook is super rare in the software world. So I'm curious, what aspects of working with Atoms would surprise people like me who've worked primarily with bits? When I do work with Atoms, I think about how that also translates to the digital world. I think actually a reason why I started a branded fruit company is because I noticed so many people took pictures of it and then put it on the internet. It's like, oh, that's really good swag. It's an avocado that people are photographing. Normally people don't photograph an avocado. <laughs> I mean, I think like making things with the material world, often it's fine crafts with my hands. It's always been a part of my toolkit, which includes digital stuff. But I always think like, I mean, I have like drawers of different types of super glue and just like plastic components and I save pieces of metal. And so I just think about physical stuff as just like a thing I could do. I think I've I've heard in some of the other interviews that you've done that you got into this stuff because you were a prop designer for yes, a while. Yes, uh, totally. I worked on uh, film sets and on uh, in theater on making props. Also, I was a I was a set designer's assistant, and the woman I worked for before she became a theater set designer, she actually worked in an automobile factory, and so she had this like really intense work ethic to like churn out things really quickly with your hands. Hmm. And I started working for her when I was like 20 in this like little studio. And I think my first day we had to like melt, we had to make a garden of flowers out of old records that we put in an oven and melted. But we had to make like tons of them for the effect to work. Also, you know, on theater pieces and films that I worked on, a lot of it was really low budget. So I had to like, you know, if I was working on a sci-fi play, I'd have to like wander around the streets and find discarded printers and then smash them open and take out the circuit boards to create a wall of circuit boards. But I think because it was really intense and I had very real deadlines and low budgets, I had to figure out how to make things as fast as possible and as cheap as possible with my hands. And I did that for many years before I left. I sometimes wonder if if constraints actually make things a lot better, even if it's more painful at the time. Like, and one of one of the things that I always compare to is like Disneyland compared to Disney World. Disneyland was made like on a relatively small budget when they didn't even know if it was a good idea, and then Disney World is this like huge park with like way more land. And you know, this is my starts from Flame Wars, but I think Disneyland is like way more charming than Disney World. Do you do you feel like you do your best work when you have constraints or is that like sort of overly romanticized and no, you would prefer to just have infinite money? <laughs> uh, it depends on the project. It's also hard to answer because I don't know what it would be like to not have constraints. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. I mean, for some things I've like needed $500 to get started because I thought that was the cheapest way I could do it. I think for sure deciding not to purchase anything new and seeing what I have at home like leads me to making things in a different way. It's also a fun puzzle to just figure out how to do things without having unlimited resources, but it is project dependent. Some things you can't do. If you are manufacturing 20,000 units of something, you need to have some upfront, you need money initially to, to fund that. 
if you're making prototypes, you sometimes don't need anything. Do you have any principles or like frameworks you use when you think about, okay, how do I do this thing on a shoestring budget? Or is it more of just like looking around and seeing what you have? It's definitely looking around and seeing what I have, then making a prototype and then taking it from there. What do I need next now that I know what it looks like? Because a lot of times I imagine something different in my head and I sort of visualize what it would look like. Then I go and make it and it's like, doesn't, it doesn't work. When I was working on my masks, my earliest prototypes were pretty terrible and I got all kinds of fabrics to print on and just like tried so many different techniques. But each time I made a prototype, I learned I had to purchase more things for the next version. But I did it very incrementally. How does building a product change when you go from just needing to build a prototype to having to turn it into a process that an assembly line can build? A lot of it is improvised. I sort of try to break down the thing I did into repeated steps and then figure out, oh, well, if one person just does this one thing, then it would make the whole process faster. When I had to make these batteries that look like Pokeballs, I made around 50 by myself, but I had to make 2,000 of them. I remember I had to find these long tables and then set up stations. And I was so nervous because I had like 11 employees coming the next day and like the night before I was trying to figure out okay what are all the different I guess one person one person should just be putting on the keychain one person should just be cleaning cleaning these one person should just be gluing the batteries but once I do a general flow of the assembly line and then I I can observe where there's bottlenecks and you know see oh this is a two-person role or I could see like oh, it would actually make sense if this person was at a different part of the table or if they were like, if they had a better storage system. So there's like tweaking, but usually it's just me running through all the parts myself first before people come over. One thing I noticed when I've hired people in the past to do something that I was previously doing is like, there's so many things that you don't think to write down or you don't think to mention because it's just like second nature. Is that an issue in physical work too, I would imagine. Yeah. I mean, for my branded fruit assembly line, someone was like burning the fruit, but I didn't realize it. Like I just wasn't watching her closely. There's like a heating element involved. And so I just like didn't tell her like, oh, don't like put this thing too close to the skin of the fruit, but I'm not overly managerial. Is that a word? Um, But I sometimes train someone and and then watch them do it once. And they're like, oh, great. And then walk away. But I don't like monitor too closely. So sometimes, you know, 100 units could get messed up because I totally overlooked saying this one thing. I could imagine that also resulting in some innovation where maybe they figure out an even better way than what you had imagined. I'm always afraid of, you know, something that I think I can do this so well, it's, I feel nervous to like give that job to someone else. But then I do notice like, oh, this person's doing it in a new way. That's so awesome. But there's definitely like, yeah, this fear at the beginning, like, oh, no, what if they can't replicate this? But then watching people just like, do their own thing. Like, that's pretty cool. And um, physical stuff. Usually each person has their own weird way of doing it, especially if it's repetitive. You sort of develop your own like motor skills around it. Who are the people who work in the assembly lines that you run in San Francisco and I believe New York as well? When I lived in New York, I sometimes had a few assistants, but I didn't start making things. I mean, I think when I moved to San Francisco, I started making way more objects. I, you know, I try to, being on an assembly line, or at least the way I run it, I think is very social, especially if you're, you know, sitting around a table doing something repetitive with your hands, you're just going to be like chatting with each other. And so I, you know, for like branded fruit, I think I worked with like 25 different people that I tried to schedule, like I was responsible for scheduling. So I tried to bring people in that I like observed were like better friends with each other. A lot of it is friends of friends of friends. Like I just email everyone I know and say, hey, do you know anyone that wants to, you know, hop on this job? And uh, it's, you know, different hours every week. Sometimes I have found people, you know, it's mostly that. I guess occasionally I've posted on Craigslist. But yeah, the people that work on my assembly line, there is like an 85-year-old who played the flute (laughs) during breaks. 
that was delightful. You know, all, all different people, like some people that are in between jobs and so just want like something super part time, but then some people who are like juggling lots of gigs, people that live all over the Bay Area. But I have loved observing the friendships that develop on the assembly line. Like the, the conversations get very deep and very emotional. And I think it's because they're like not making eye contact and they have this like they they could be comfortable with silence, too, because they have this like goal that they're you know doing this thing with their hands. It's like art therapy. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of fun. I would really like to actually do something like that with my <laughs> friends. Like I feel like. Uh, you know, when I, I recently moved and my boyfriend and I were putting together furniture a lot. Mm, um, yeah. And like, that was like a really satisfying activity. And initially I was thinking like, oh, maybe I should hire someone to do some of these. And I did that for the bulkier items where I would like actually hurt my back because I'm a small person. Mm -hmm. But but with all the other ones, I actively enjoyed doing it. And I would like look forward to that part of my day every day where I got to like yeah. put together a stool or something. I think it's fun when you, if you know that it's just like a temporary thing. So I have, when I was running my fruit factory, I actually had a long wait list of people who wanted to work on it because like word got out that the assembly line was fun. And you paid them as well, right? Yeah, or, no, or, I paid, of course yeah. I paid everyone. But actually people did reach out and they're like, hey, I just want to come see what it's like. You don't have to pay me. Let me work on the assembly line. I'd say no, like. You can't do, be a tourist. You can't be an assembly line <laughs> tourist. If you want to come and work for fun, then you have to buy us lunch. Because <laughs> I don't want, I don't know, it's just a weird dynamic if some people need the money and some people are like doing it just for recreation. It's just, right. it just feels really weird to me. So if they want to be a recreational assembly line worker, they have to pay us for the entertainment. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I think like, when you, if you know it's temporary, like the Pokeball assembly line I ran was so much fun because it only lasted two weeks and we all knew that. But if you knew that this repetitive task that you're doing with your hands is like going to be the next few years, I think that's kind of draining. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, and if it's, if it's totally repetitive and if it's many hours a day as opposed to like one hour in the afternoon for two weeks, um, it's a very different, different thing. Yeah. And yeah, I tried to like, you know, shake things up for people, like give them different tasks if they were coming in every day, like give them a new thing. Or like sometimes I would, instead of us all hanging out, we would like listen to a podcast. And then I would also change up the people that, you know, r shuffle around the assembly line folks so that they'd meet new people because that also shakes up your day. So you've also gone to visit some factories in Shenzhen, and I'm curious, like, how is the physical space in those factories organized? No, I had a conception before I ever went there that I thought it would just be these, like, white rooms with conveyor belts and people in suits. Like, I guess I had an image that it was, like, the media covers of Apple factories, but... The factories I visited, a lot of them were like so clued together, these sheds and garages. Sometimes the different parts were in different buildings because the operation was growing gradually, but they couldn't rent out the place next door. So they had to rent something a block away. Just so much flavor, like art on the walls and like cats and there aren't uniforms necessarily. A lot of people just like chatting very intricate social dynamics like you know people at the factory are friends and prefer to sit at a different table and it I think like yeah it was very different than my previous conception and reminded me of my own operations just seeing how things were sort of hacked together and there are a lot of things that surprised me that like weren't automated I mean went to a, I was manufacturing bicycle helmets when I went to a factory that actually makes helmets for major brands, I can't say which ones, but you know, helmets that you would see in a store, you could, they were made at this factory. And there was this floor where they were, you know, like helmets had vent holes. Uh, there was this long table and everyone had like a razor blade taped up to their thumb. And they were like cutting out the vent holes by like, moving their wrist in a swoopy motion it was actually kind of it was like a dance but i thought that would be cut out 
through machines. But a lot of the helmets you get at like Target, like someone hand cut the vent holes. That's really impressive because I'm imagining they're like very circular as well. Yeah, I mean, it's a thinner plastic, so it pops out more easily because it's like a vacuum formed thing and, you know, there's nothing behind it. So it does pop out because it has like a divot. They did have, like, I asked if they had any automated way to do it. And they had one machine, but it was so much more slow than a person doing it. And the machine itself was expensive and you'd have to program it. Like, you know, with a person, you could have them be working on multiple helmet shapes. If it's a robot, you'd have to like recalibrate. And someone would have to like put each helmet on the robot. And it's like, oh, there's a lot of operations where it is easier to do this with people. Of course, that could change if robots become more dexterous, but then the cost of them is really high too. So it's, yeah, but that was so surprising to me. Was there anything that was automated that you expected to not be automated? I mean, there were a lot of things that I suspected were automated, but I didn't know exactly how. I saw, I went to a factory when I was like researching ways that I could print on fruit. I flew to Shenzhen and I went to a factory that printed the eyes on dolls heads and I just had no idea how that was done. Like I thought, Oh, maybe a person paints them, which is probably true. Like at some factories, Barbie's eyes all have this, like, you know, how do you print on a curved surface? And I saw the whole like conveyor belt with this like tiny balloon that's like dipped in ink and then like, you know, pushed onto the plastic and I just thought it was very mesmerizing but I just thought whoa I have never considered how eyes are put on doll's heads have you seen I think it's like a twitter account and probably an instagram account and that sort of thing too machine called, picks? Like, how, yeah machine picks yeah I, from from talking to you I sense that machine picks is like maybe a little misleading where I believe that all of the videos they share are real but it sounds like they're really like a subset of what manufacturing looks like Yeah, I know a lot of those. I love that Twitter account. Like a lot of those machines are like at factories, but also mixed with human labor. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the machines require that someone like continuously loads them. It's pretty interesting, though, that I feel I I don't know if I can point to any of those videos that like actually have people in them or at least people are not starving in them. Which is Yeah, like it's usually hand, maybe hands, but it's mostly just machines. I get the sense that there's just this machine, like a a building that is basically a giant machine and it just goes down the path and like there's no people who touch it or if they do, they're just watching it or something. I mean, for some items, yes. If you you hang out on Alibaba (laughs) and look up types of machines, you can see machines that are the size of a room. And yeah, it probably requires like some loading at the front, but then it comes out like cereal (laughs) right um i actually watched a lot of videos of i was really interested in mask production like earlier earlier last year so i saw a lot of videos on how surgical masks are made but i would say like you know each factory is totally different when i went to look at helmet factories each one had their own different process they had different machines they were different sizes you know some factories are 150 people some are 450 people with if you're like ordering surgical masks from china some will come from factories with machines that are fully automated some will come from factories where a person is using an ultrasonic press putting each mask into it and fusing the elastic by their hand with their hand it's i mean same with any company. <laughs> You're going to have like tiny, tiny companies and large companies that are sort of doing the same thing, but have different resources. What What are the sorts of differences in resources that, that drive that diversity? I think it is how much business they have, how much money they have. I did talk to like, a lot of the factories call the person who runs it just the boss, which I thought was so weird. <laughs> Like, you know, people would interview like, oh, I will introduce you to the boss, which is always some some man. But uh, I talked to one boss at a helmet factory 
and he started out as a worker on another factory and like slowly slowly like saved up money to start his own but started as a super tiny operation and then just like gradually kept reinvesting like investing in more space more employees it's also like you know if you're running a factory in Shenzhen you also are paying for lodging and food for your employees people live there it's a campus which is actually you know so different than anything in this country yeah I mean I think it's like you yeah you land you try to get you try to get repeat business from larger clients and then take that money and scale your operation and just keep doing it gradually. Yeah. It, it makes me wonder about big brands that are sort of often seen as easy mm. replacements for each other, like, you know, Uber and Lyft or Pepsi and Coke, where you think that they're, they're probably very similar on the inside, but actually the, the way they're run, is probably radically different from each other and similar in some ways, but like the way they, you know, triage support requests or something could just be really very different. Yeah, Yeah, maybe. Uh, But it's also possible that they're getting their cans from the same place. True. Yeah. Like there's a lot of, I mean, at any factory, you're going to see that they're making things for multiple companies, sometimes competing companies. Also, like usually companies source their stuff from many factories in case one mysteriously shuts down. Right. So you don't have the supply so, chain problems we were seeing yeah. in March 2020. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So beyond these assembly lines, where do you mm-hmm. do your work? You know, I haven't done so many assembly lines since the pandemic, but I actually, I had like a, a rented space for my fruit factory in San Francisco. I actually really wanted to take advantage of having that space. The building was demolished, but I was in like an art studio. And, you know, because I had this like long wait list to be on the assembly line, I actually did want to run sort of an assembly line immersive theater event out of the space, but couldn't do it because of the pandemic. But now I just make things in like, you know, my home space I've got a lot of machines around I have my fruit printer I have like a nine foot fabric printer vacuum former an air compressor I've got a lot of machines when do you decide to buy a machine is it like when you first have the idea or is it after you've done it by hand like 10 times or like what's the what's the trigger point where you go okay I'm going to invest in buying a machine well I have craigslist alerts (laughs) so if I find a good deal on a machine I got this like tiny I've always wanted a vacuum former and even bought components to make my own but then like I had a craigslist alert and found someone getting rid of their vacuum former for like what is a vacuum former oh a vacuum former it's basically a way a way to like make plastic molds of an object so like if you put an object in it, it heats up, it heats up thin layer of plastic, and then you push the plastic down onto the object, but a vacuum sucks the air out of it. So it creates a, a very detailed mold of that thing. And then you can fill it so you can, you know, fill the negative space and then make a replica. So like imagine a chocolate mold or a soap mold, but like a little larger. Oh, man, now you're making me hungry. <laughs> I could make a lot of chocolate molds. I haven't. I tried to make a jello mold out of this, which so I tried to make any, like some jello tools. Would it would it be correct to say that like this makes things where plastic has like a really smooth, usually round like some sort of like rounded shape? Like I don't know. Or it, what it are other examples? Like- it could be a square shape. I mean, it's super thin plastic, so it picks up details. And my, the size of my machine is only like 10 by 12. Ideally, I would want a 24 by 24 one so I could vacuum form shells on helmets. Like that's what I wanted it for. But yeah, it creates a mold of anything. Like, you know, you could stick your phone in there and then it would create a mold of your phone. Would it ruin your phone? <laughs> Actually, yeah, I wouldn't put my phone in there. <laughs> I'd put an old phone in there. It's super hot. It's like hot molten plastic. Right. So... I was like, am I imagining this wrong? <laughs> I mean, it probably wouldn't, but I, I don't want to. I don't want to risk it. <laughs> yeah, it um, seems seems like a, a risk for sure. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I don't like. I mean, I don't buy machines unless I like have a purpose for them. I've never bought a three D printer because I've never felt like I needed one for anything. I would love a laser cutter though, or CNC. But have you I used one out. elsewhere? 
I used to go to Noise Bridge, which is like a hacker space in San Francisco that is just like open to the public. And they have a pretty broken laser cutter there that always takes hours to use. And I I have used that one. I used that for making like for cutting out my acrylic and wood to make clouds, physical clouds. Can you explain to the in. audience what the physical clouds are? It is a is an optical illusion that's made of planes of acrylic. And when you look at it, uh, so imagine um, like 10 planes of acrylic, but each one has this part sanded out. So when you, so it's kind of fuzzy in the middle. So when all of these are stacked, it's the illusion of a floating cloud. If that makes sense. You can look it up. <laughs> I think my company is physical.cloud. Um, <laughs> I like that you have so many companies that you're not entirely sure what it's I called. I forgot the but... domain. I have so many domain names. I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you can also like slide things in it. So it's like cloud storage. I did. I made this joke in 2015 when cloud storage was in the zeitgeist. It's kind of just normal now. They actually look really good too. I remember when I when I looked, looked up a picture of these, I was like, wow, they're actually really very pretty. Mm, it's, not just, yeah. it's not just a joke. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah, they're cool sculptures, the way that the light hits them, like they form really cool sh reflections and shadows. I enjoyed when I was making lots of them, I always had a stack of clouds in in my room. And I thought it was really beautiful when like, the, yeah, when the sun was setting on the clouds. How, how do you shape your physical and digital environment to make mm. your work more effective, more creative, more fun? Well, I guess regarding my my physical environment is definitely investing in tools so things are faster. I upgraded my, I used to have like a tiny die cutter, like a silhouette cameo, which is like a popular desktop die cutter, but I invested in a fancy graph tech so I could like cut stickers, vinyl, or even aut automate drawings very quickly. So then I don't have to like, when things are less bandwidth to create, then I feel more creative. When I know oh, I don't have to babysit this thing for hours, then I'm more inspired to actually do it. Same, I guess that also translates to the digital world. I use a lot of automation tools. Actually, I love using Zapier for like any website I set up. I have forms triggering things. Or if you call a phone number that's like related to one of my stunts, like... I get a notification or it automates an email. I just have a lot of automations in place, especially things going into spreadsheets. And so I just don't have to do so many repetitive tasks, which makes me more excited about launching stuff. Yeah, just less of a slog for each one. Yeah. And for making landing pages, like instead of spending hours tweaking CSS, I mostly use Card, which is like a web page builder of course you do have to like put in code snippets and stuff but i don't have to worry about margins and font sizes <laughs> what are some tools that you use that you don't see other people using as much i don't know anyone who has a nine foot printer at home <laughs> <laughs> though i got i mean i actually was a beta tester for hp this is why i have this printer but it's around yeah it's around nine feet i use it for i use it all the time and that is a superpower. And I feel so lucky that I have one of these. Uh, that's not a great answer because it's not like anyone listening can easily go get one of these <laughs> machines. I do think having, um, you know, I don't have this anymore because I upgraded my die cutter. But I think having a tiny desktop die cutter at home to make to make your own stickers, logos, signage, all that stuff actually makes your work have uh, so much more professionalism. And it's just super useful. If you want to like put a sign on your door or like prank a friend or like suddenly design a t-shirt or just like make a few experimental stickers, but you just want like 10 and you don't want to order like a few hundred of them online. Like it's a super useful desktop tool. And I think a lot of people don't know that they can, you know, find one on Craigslist. <laughs> How much do they usually cost? I think like a new one is around $150, but 
you could find used ones for like 80 or 90. It's, you know, it, when I first got them, they were sort of new. Like I got my first one, I think in 2011. At this point, because they're like 10 years old, you could find a used one and they, they still are compatible with new computers. So that's a lot cheaper than I would have predicted. So that's, that's a good yeah. point. I mean, they're slow and tiny. That's why, I, you know, I updated mine to a, a graph tech, but like they're pretty useful for making logos and stuff. When you're buying a new machine or tool that you've never had before, mm-hmm. how do you decide how nice of an expensive one to buy? Like, do you, do you go for the mm-hmm. cheapest ones so you can test it out? Or you go, do you go for the most expensive ones so that you actually like use it and it's it actually works? I think I usually go for the cheapest one unless it's like integral to something. Like if I'm using the thing just to play with, I would go for the cheapest thing. If it's integral to my business, I would like get the fancier thing. Even like for, you know, purchasing media for my printer, I like would buy cheaper fabrics at first and cheaper papers at first until I know what I want to keep replicating and then I get a fancier thing. I usually don't start with a fancy thing. Yeah, that makes sense. I I've I sometimes wonder like, you know, if someone goes to Noisebridge and uses the the br- semi broken laser cutter and that's their first experience with the laser cutter, then they might think, "Oh, these things are no fun or it doesn't really do what that's I want it true. to do." Have you ever had yeah. that experience with like the cheaper version where it just doesn't work and you you think, "Oh, I don't actually <laughs> like this," but actually you would have loved it if you had gotten yeah, the fancy one? Yeah, you know, I'm experiencing that right now. I actually run my printer on a on a Windows 7. <laughs> Oh boy. I have a really old PC laptop because someone just gave it to me for free. And I was like, I could spend a few hundred dollars or actually probably even less and get a nicer laptop because this one's so slow. It takes me forever to load images and like use, use the internet. And uh, I should upgrade it, but I also sometimes just get used to things until <laughs> I experience the nicer version. Then like, oh, why aren't I doing that? I've experienced that with my like with my bicycle as well. Like I used to have a really terrible bi- bike, but I didn't re- like it was just super heavy. It was like from the 1970s. And I once tried a nicer bike. I was like, "Why was I on that thing?" And I think um <laughs> I don't know, it's hard to realize that your process is inefficient unless you jump into something nicer with any sort of technology. You could get so used to things being that's really oh that's just how it is i think what motivates me to research other things if if it becomes like a very serious if it becomes a very serious bottleneck or just by luck stumbling into something that's nicer like i didn't know about this graph tech uh, cutter until i saw it somewhere else so i had a similar experience with a suitcase where i think i'd had the same suitcase since i was like seven or something like that and then it it literally fell apart so I couldn't use it anymore yeah like two years ago three years ago before COVID and I bought a new one like I realized wait the wheels could like not make the noise and (laughs) wow I can have multiple zippers and like wow this is really amazing (laughs) totally but like you didn't know yeah you didn't seek that out because that was just your suitcase and that's what your life is like (laughs) yeah it just didn't even cross my mind that this could be better I do find that sometimes I have the op- opposite pathology though, where I like am constantly keeping an eye out for new tools that could like make me more effective or more happy or more efficient mm-hmm. or whatever. But then you can spend so much time like looking for tools that you don't actually use them and you, you're like That's not true. doing the goals. So there's yeah. always balance. I also think with a, I mean, there's a lot of companies where you could like outsource work on a tool. Like you can get something 3D printed for you. And sometimes I have friends that like ask me like, oh, what 3D printer should I buy? I want to do this project. And they think I know about machines. And I'm just like, well, if you're just making one unit, you don't need to own a 3D printer. Like just use use like one of the many services that do that for you. Yeah, I think it depends on how how much do you want to commit to using this thing and like how how important is it going to be to your creative flow? And if it's very important, then having your own can be really nice because now you just you just start using it. Uh, but yeah. if it's just one, then it's pretty expensive to buy a 3D printer. Totally, totally. 
yeah, I was like for my mask company, I was considering running the whole assembly line here in San Francisco, like, you know, print, I have a fabric printer. And I thought like, oh, I could just like, you know, hire people to operate the fabric printer, and then like heat seal it, and maybe I should invest in other printers and rent a space. And then I realized, oh, there's like companies that specialize in custom printed garments that can also sew that just like do this. That is their job. They have figured it all out. There's no need to reinvent this. I can hire them. So. I guess that was less true for the branded fruit company. For for unique processes that no one's doing, yeah, like you're stuck doing it on your own. Mm-hmm. So the, the ideas behind all of the different things that you've built mm-hmm. are always very creative and a little cheeky and, you know, end up doing processes that no one's ever done before. And like, I mean, I could list a lot of really amazing ones. One of the ones we haven't even mentioned yet is like a cryptocurrency ledger that's basically <laughs> a Swiss Army knife with a crypto wallet inside of it. And like the list goes on and on. Yeah. Like, where were you physically when you thought of some of these ideas and, and what were you doing at that moment? Oh, what, how did I think of the crypto wallet? I think it came from, well, people don't really use crypto wallets anymore, but they, in 2017, they were a new concept. I think a friend handed me a crypto wallet at some event and I held it and I just thought this thing is so flimsy and like I could lose it so I need to make it heavier and then my mind leaped to putting it in a pocket knife but then I thought that was a funny joke I kind of I don't know I think ideas come to me when I like am dissatisfied with something and then I'm like how do I tweak my how do I tweak my own thing just for myself but then I realize oh this is a this is a funny thing that would resonate with people on the internet yeah, and I like I like the prompt of like, wouldn't it be funny if dot dot dot. Yeah, my I do I think that way a lot and a lot of my ideas are not funny too. I just think <laughs> have a I just have a lot of them and then I pick and choose which ones I want to make public. Well, you definitely have a lot of very funny ideas. So you must have <laughs> a lot of ideas. If the more ideas you have, the more well, like okay, the more decent ones are going to be mixed in. Yeah, you're you're really like incredibly prolific and I don't know very many other people who are nearly as prolific as you are, but I think a lot of people strive to be. And so mm-hmm. I wonder, like, what do you think you're doing differently from, from them? I have a few advantages. I will say this. I have been self-employed, like, you know, throughout my adult life, most of the time. I mean, I've had, I haven't worked for like a major company and actually I've never focused on having a career. And I think because that part of my brain is removed, I mostly focus on like, what do I want to create? I have, I feel like I have more bandwidth because I am not focused on any sort of career for myself. If that makes sense. What do you mean by career? Like, I don't know. I mean, it's, I, I make, I make lots of things and sell them, but I've never decided to like, become an industrial designer and like, you know, climb the ranks of internships and networking and having particular jobs or like deciding to be a UX researcher. Like I've never really focused on a particular role. And I think because I don't have, (laughs) I think maybe it's a lack of ambition of working with, working for companies that makes me hyper focused on creating artwork and stuff. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I think I think I know what you mean. Like a lot of brain cycles end up going towards like things that are not exactly creative, but rather, you know, does my does my boss like me so that Exactly. When exactly. Promotion, like stuff it's and then the and social, like a surprising it, amount of brain cycles. Totally. And it's also like you focusing on yeah, social dynamics and hierarchies and like who do I need to network with? And I like tend to avoid all such all worlds which require, I don't know, anything that feels too networky, <laughs> I shy away from and just spend a lot of time just alone making things. And I, you know, I try to encourage, I think I've been running a thing for four years called The Decruiter, which is like a service for people who are on the fence about quitting their job. And I do have this conversation with a lot of people that like they feel so creatively, like their creative self is so committed to their coworkers and, you know, having their, this company succeed. 
when they have all these ideas for things they want to do on their own, but if they don't have, if their you know company doesn't give them the free time or bandwidth, then they like always table their projects for later. And I do try to encourage people to have more boundaries with, you know, their employer so that they can work on their side projects or have a practice out of like dedicating like Saturdays to, you know, doing a thing that you want to do, not for anyone else. I think that's like a symptom of a lot of companies, like being very creatively demanding of people. And I think I have felt, I've been fortunate that I've been able to support myself and I've noticed times when of course, I'm not always productive or prolific. Like I've gone through periods of time where I've made like nothing, but often that's because I'm like working for another person. A very rough trend that seems to have happened in the last, I don't know, 70 years or so Mm -hmm. is the sense that like you don't need to have as much of a framework provided for you to start something so like it used to be like i don't know if you Mm. if you wanted to work on a computer company in the 1950s you probably need to go to ibm or like that's at least the most obvious yeah and like you know as time goes on it feels like less and less the case and i wonder like what do you think you would have been working on if you were you know in your prime years in the 1950s instead of instead of now oh in the 1950s or maybe 1970s Whoa. or like some previous yeah, time. Yeah, different. Because <laughs> 1950s are maybe a really long. It's, they're, it's they're suck also to be, it's suck to be a woman in the 1950s, honestly. Yeah. I'm glad I'm not. There were other constraints maybe going glad. on there too. Yeah, I mean, I think in the 19... If it, in the 1970s, I don't know. I think that because like through... Most of my life, I've had so much positive reinforcement for making things with my hands, which I actually don't like love doing. And I actually definitely identify more with being a digital creator and like making apps and internet art. But I probably would have been a craftsman of some sort, like a sign painter or like, I don't know, anything that was like useful career making something with my hands that has now been replaced with machines like. Paint, sign painting <laughs> it's i'm really excited to see see how this like continues as as like more and more tools become available to, to people and you can have a whole 3d printer in, in your house now which and you can there's all these sorts of things i i hope that this like gets more people to think about like hey what can i be doing on my own as opposed to needing to work within the framework of a really big company like google used to do it i don't know if they still do the like this thing where you can spend 20% of your time just working on random creative projects, which is problematic. (laughs) Because it's also like, oh, well, in your spare time, you can just mess around and do whatever you want. But it's all RIP. And it's all for us. And I think like, I think that yeah, some companies should just consider giving people time off to work on their own projects that are not owned by the company. I have seen that happening more and more. Like the, the company mm. I used to work for, GitHub, had a very, I mean, I'm going to get some of the legalism wrong here, but basically they, they said like anything you do as a side project while you're at the company is yours. And they would That's be cool. very like, um, very, you know, sort of pro-employee if there was ever a conflict. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were a few like instances where that came up. I thought that was great because I'm someone who like worked on a lot of random things in my free time. So even though I hadn't even thought about the IP angle when I when I joined, I remember being like, okay, I, I appreciate that they're making a stand about this because now mm-hmm. it's not even a question in my mind that I can work on this stuff. That's great, but that's that's rare too. GitHub too, they kind of they kind of have to because it's a company based all around open source. So it yeah. would be pretty weird if they they didn't allow it. Um so yeah. I, I don't see a lot of other companies adopting that too soon. But yeah, I totally. Hope so. Yeah. And I think another thing with like working on creative projects is to not be afraid of just launching something, even if it's like not finished and stuff. Why do you think people are afraid? I think people, you know, especially if it's your first time, like unleashing your creative work into the world, I think that you have no, people don't know how it will be received. People don't know if it's a good idea they will think it's not polished enough or that they need more things in place or they need someone to tell them the launch date. Like they just need a lot of handholding and encouragement when it's actually a pretty low bandwidth to just 
launch out a half finished idea and see the response. Even make a landing page for something without having finished the project, just to see if it's worth creating or or to ride off the momentum you get when people see it and say, this is awesome. But I think things don't need to be totally polished before they are released into the world. Yeah. Yeah, it is super, super motivating. I feel like if you're really very unconfident, you could also ask for feedback on on something and be like, hey, guys, like, I really want your input on this. And then they'll help you find the things that need to be improved. I get feedback from my friends for so many projects before I launch them. That is like a secret thing, because I often just suddenly launch things, you know, seems like it came from thin air, but I've actually been dwelling on it for months and have been like going through many iterations and get feedback behind the scenes. Definitely like to casually run ideas by friends, especially ones that are critical and not like supportive of all the things that I do. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Even ideas for spontaneous pranks. I have like yet texted friends. I'm like, is this too weird? Or is this too illegal? Um, And just see what they say. (laughs) I just need some hint of positive feedback. Right. Yeah. I think something that I've struggled with some friends is that I think I've tried, I've always tried to be the friend who always actually says what I think about their thing when they ask me. Mm. And this works great with some people, but with other people, they're like, wait a second, I just want you to be supportive. Yeah, it depends. It's good to ask. I think I like when friends ask me, what kind of feedback do you want? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think because asking, do you want feedback is a tough question because who's going to say, no, I don't want feedback. Right. But I think what kind <laughs> gives you a little more flexibility to be like, okay, like this, these are the areas where I'm looking for. And these are the areas where I'm like really not interested in it because I'm very committed to this aspect. Yeah. I recently launched uh, this project called Co-Founder Quest where I hid floppy disks all over the Bay Area. And then the floppy disks have a link to a website that's this whole choose your own adventure, interactive fiction style game. I was so nervous about launching this thing and actually postponed it for a long time because I did get a lot of negative feedback from the initial game, which was actually very harsh, but made the project so much better. If you don't mind sharing what what kind of feedback was. My initial game, you know, I just had this idea of hiding floppy disks and putting a game on it, but I didn't think too deeply about the details of the game. And so my initial game was you go to this website and it's like cute and has this like old MS-DOS music playing. But the first question was, are you a software engineer? Yes or no? And it was like this whole sort of interactive job application. And... Like, I realized that wasn't that much fun, (laughs) but only (laughs) after I got feedback. Like, I sent it to software engineers and they were like, oh, well, it's a cute marketing tactic, but I don't think I'd apply because I would see through the trick. I'd be like, ha, you, you, you used a clever way to get me to this advertisement for a job. And then I thought, oh, well, I need to not make it about, like, the game shouldn't be about, you know, proving you're a software engineer and, like, your skills and stuff. The game should just be an exploration of what my company is. And it could really be for anyone to play that then maybe they would know the right person for the job. So my whole game is about a day in the life of a person who just like uses my app dial up and then like through a series of encounters learns that I'm hiring someone, but it's not explicit. And I tried to make it fun and have, you know, change up the style and change the music. But I spent so much time tweaking this and putting it in front of um, software engineers who would be like the target audience. That's amazing. There's so many people out there who are trying to figure out ways to, to get into people's inboxes. Um, and like, <laughs> I, I have, I mean, this is actually a total jer- jerk thing that I do, but I can't help myself. I'm sorry. Which is when, whenever a recruiter emails me with a completely just inane email that is completely unpersonalized and I can tell that they're mass emailing everyone on LinkedIn. I have this, like this stock thing that's on my clipboard at all times. It's just please don't ever email me again for recruiting purposes, including responding to this email. And I just like paste it in and I send it because like sort of they're doing the opposite of what you're doing, which is they don't really care about what my experience is. They don't actually care if I am interested in the company. All they care about is that like they can like send a recruiting lead and like hopefully I take the job and for the maximum salary. And it's just a very frustrating experience. This is this sounds like a much more fun way to get a job. <laughs> I mean, they are being like they are being paid for you know 
getting as many leads as possible. So that's their incentive. Yes, I wanted to like self-select with my game and not spam anyone and have people seek me out instead of me seeking them out. It's fantastic. That's why I literally hid floppy disks and like planted them and, you know, made it obvious on the internet that I was doing this. So that's where most of my leads come from. But I have not been spammy. So now that it's been a few days since you rolled Mm -hmm. it out, what's the result been? Uh, over 10,000 people have played it, which I didn't know. I For any project I launch, even though many of them go viral, I always think it won't. <laughs> <laughs> this didn't exactly go viral, but it actually did better than I thought it would. I didn't, I mean, it's pretty niche. It's, but yeah, I got 10,000 players through and a third of them actually played the whole game, which is actually very high, but I did spend a lot of time tweaking it so it'd be short and fun. And I've been getting so many mixed, I mean, definitely through my, in my applications, I think like 5% of them are interested. (laughs) So I'm only meeting with a few people. The game had a weird effect where like in the game you meet me. And so I think people think they already know me. So I'm getting so many (laughs) unhinged, like hate, like just such casual emails that are not professional. Like I want people to be a little bit professional and attach their resume and links to their work and stuff. But I'm getting these very run on, too casual. (laughs) I mean, they're interesting. I think like, of course, my game will attract weird responses. It's a weird experience. But you'll also probably find someone really appreciates a lot of the same things that you do, which is a really cool way to do it. Because yes. you're showing your values in the way that you've built it. Yeah. And um, I've already started doing interviews. And like, yeah, I did one yesterday. And the person I met was like, totally understood, even though I was, it's, it's hard to explain your vision for a startup in a concise, neat way, especially if you've not, you know, I've built a voice shut up that lots of people use, but my co-founder quest is for my next idea. And I felt like, oh, how do I explain this vision? And the person just totally got it. I was like, oh, it translated. That's so cool. Like you played the game and you understood not just the idea, but how the game itself relates to the thing that I want to build. And they're just like, got what I wanted out of it. That is so cool. It's cool to meet the like, yeah, sort of, it, I think the game attracted more like-minded people or, you know, people that like understood the sort of thing I want to build. But simultaneously, I, I wanted the game to attract people I have not met yet. So like I wanted to go outside of my circles. Yeah. Doing sort of all sorts of different things on the internet, whether it's tweeting or doing a stunt Mm -hmm. or whatever, Mm -hmm. I feel like is a really useful way to be like a lighthouse to draw people Mm -hmm. in who like the kinds of people that you want to hang out with. Yeah. Uh, And this is like one of the more creative ways that I've seen someone do that. The amazing thing is like, yeah, putting a project on the internet that gets shared helps you meet people that you would not just meet at a party. And who are not a friend yeah. of a friend. And so it just, yeah, it expands like the number of minds you can meet, which then leads to more serendipitous moments of finding unexpected overlap between people. And I wanted LionCon to be something that anyone can attend, even if you're just happen to stumble into us at the in the line <laughs> and then hang out, which totally happened. And yeah, I love I love like introducing people that would not normally meet. That's a theme. So to, to that's a perfect transition to talk a little bit about Dial-Up, which is oh, the yeah. company that you started. What are some requests that you've gotten for Dial-Up that you found interesting but decided not to pursue because they didn't quite match your goals for the product? Oh, like requests for product features? Mm-hmm. It's t- that's <laughs> It's so painful to discuss because a lot of product features I want to do, but it's like that will take three months of engineering resources. <laughs> and is it worth it? That's like the hardest thing about running a startup is if you're a creative person working on a company, there's probably like 10 different directions you want to go in <laughs> that might all be great. But like you can't, you have to choose something. You know, I've always wanted to make dial up right now for some context connects people all over the world who do not know each other to discuss particular topics. Like on Wednesday night, you could read a poem to each other or on Monday nights, you can discuss what you're making for dinner. If you're a new parent, you can meet other new parents. Like it's, you know, topic based, but it's like not anyone, you know, it's someone anywhere. They could be in like a rural part of Alaska or they can be in South Korea. It's like so random, so many ages and, and different walks of life. But 
I've always wanted to make a version for my friends. I've wanted to like pick up the phone and match with a surprise friend. And I like went down the path of developing this thing with like, you know, building your friend list and stuff. But it's difficult to have that exist on the same app as an app where you're meeting strangers. And also like, it's so much, it's really difficult to convince your friends to be on an app. (laughs) and build out a social network and build out a social graph. But, you know, it's something that I personally have on dial-up. I have my own, I I can, you know, do my own special features. So I can match with surprise friends. But that's the thing other people want. Like, people have requested, they're like, I don't want to meet a random stranger. I want to talk to, like, a random person from my family. Or I want to know, like, when I'm free, I want to just know when other friends are free and I can hop on the phone with them. But... I never developed that. And that's a possible thing that I could put into my next version. And there's all these, of course, people want super niche topics. They're like, yeah, I want to meet, I want to talk to other game designers in Montreal. And yeah, that's possible. If I have millions of users, you could find those people. Yeah, but you need a big density to, to make that happen. Yeah. So I mean, with all these, with all the different ideas, it does require that people are already on the app. Right. And that has its own set of challenges. But the direction I'm going in is kind of different. I'm like going in the direction of having dial up be a tool. So like letting people build their own voice experiences on it. So if they wanted to develop like a special voice chat app for game designers in Montreal, then they can without coding it. That sounds really interesting. What are what are the primitives that you're going to offer them so they can do that? Mm, uh, So the ability to have this sort of like switchboard in the app that they can uh, design a bunch of things. They can design like, well, like the schedule of when the thing calls, but also design the like, what do you when someone picks up the phone, what do they hear? They could also choose. Is it a like group? Is it a group chat? Is it like a one on one thing? Is it random? Are you always matched with the same person? Like, what are the what is the algorithm that you can choose to to match people or they could decide it is not going to be it is not going to be like live voice i just want to you know have this thing that calls everyone and they listen to this sort of pre-recorded voice thing for 10 minutes and that's a way to like stay connected Maybe people take turns recording the voice thing. I mean, I'm I'm rambling of many different possible things. But the main idea is that it is going to be like a switchboard. And of course, I will have to, with designing any sort of tool, I think you have to put it in front of people and see what the most overlap of needs are and experiment with many possible use cases and then shave and then really shave it down as to like what are the core features. Because I can think of so many different use cases for like wanting a tool to build audio experiences. I have talked to museums about it, like designing an audio experience that when you're in a museum, you can like talk to someone in another museum looking at work by the same artist and they want me to build that. But then like, like, oh, well, what is a what is a tool I could give you so that you can build it and set up your own system? Those are all really cool use cases. It sort of reminds me of almost like a a, a Reddit, but for audio. That's that's flattens it a little too much. But like you know how you can customize yeah. subreddits and yeah, and like each Reddit is has its own moderators and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's a bit of a misleading. Yeah, Reddit for audio, but like also it would take place on an app and be like WebRTC and. I mean, I guess this is about my creative process. I can sometimes imagine like too many things. And then once I put it in front of people, then I have a eureka moment of knowing what to do. And I feel like I'm in a phase right now of putting ideas in front of people without having landed on the one thing that I want to do with this. But I do know that people love these intimate one-on-one phone calls. I have been running this for two years and I do know there's lots of people contacting me on how they can do a very specific thing with it and they ask me to set set that up and I know it's possible to like you know make a tool for them yeah I've been finding over the course of the pandemic that I actually enjoy phone calls a lot more than than video Mm -hmm. calls people have philosophized as to why 
but it really feels much more intimate, even though you're actually getting less information. I also think like that you're in many ways getting more information because you use your imagination. Mm. I'm like, a am a very visual person. Yet I love audio experiences because, I mean, it's similar to reading a book. I think when you're talking to someone, you can visualize or like take all the cues and like sort of imagine a scene for them. And simultaneously, you can take in all the senses on your end without staring at a screen. Like right now I'm talking to you, but I'm actually staring at my window and watching the trees sway and just I'm paying attention to the way the light falls on the walls and all these details of my room, which is actually a more rich experience than if I was staring at your screen. So in many ways, you're in the room with me here. But I'm also imagining like I have this, you know, vague imagination of where you are, too. Yeah. And, and more of your senses are stimulated. And so you're more engaged. I also think that people tend to have more vulnerable and intimate conversations when it's through voice. I mean, I know like. The calls on dial-up are so long. <laughs> We've had an 11 hour long call, which is crazy. Oh, wow. <laughs> but many of them are like an hour and a half. And I think like that, I mean, that's crazy because it's people that have never met. And I think that you could sort of get more because your face is shielded. And if you're, you know, discussing sad topics or you're like trying to search for words, it's less awkward to pause when you're talking through voice than if you are staring at each other. If you are staring at each other, you might be more self-conscious that you've been silent or that you're staring off into the distance to think of the answer. And there's just all these more things you have to worry about as being like a good conversationalist that sometimes disappears when you're talking through voice. Yeah. And when you have video, even though they can see, they can see you, they can't see everything around you. So for example, like if I'm taking notes during a meeting, I feel like I have to clarify, like I'm typing, but not because I'm writing an email. I'm taking, I'm taking notes about what you're talking about versus like in a, in a, a normal conversation where you're face to face in person or it with an audio only where they can't see that you're typing. You like don't have to clarify that the information they're getting is not problematic. How do video call memories differ from phone call me memories? Mm. <laughs> I actually have a lot of video call memories blur together because I'm I usually leave my computer in the same place. I have my monitor in the same place. So I feel like I've met so many new people in the last year, but like I kind of forget <laughs> who is who. Through voice, I'm actually pretty mobile. Like I will I'm a fidgeter, so I kind of wander when I'm on the phone, I kind of wander around my place. And then I'll like end up sitting in some new corner or like playing with some objects or like I don't know just like touching the leaves of a plant and so then I'll associate that plant with the person or I do stuff with my hands I am either like drawing or like um fidgeting with something or like putting labels on floppy disks or whatever like manual thing I have to do <laughs> or putting logos on fruit <laughs> But I like that's a more cohesive memory because it's like a different activity for each person. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I also just remember my imagination of them. And it's surprising, like people run into each other on dial up sometimes. Well, you could like choose if you want to talk to someone again. So then it like weights the algorithm. So you're more likely to run into them. And it's cool that like people really remember each other just from their voice. Yeah. How, how has having conversations with people through dial-up changed your outlook and your conversation skills? Oh my God. Okay. Like it's so, this is so hard to translate, but I kind of think every person is fascinating if you talk to them for at least 20 minutes. Like even someone you would immediately judge as like, oh, they're not that interesting whatever. I wouldn't normally hang out with them or like they're not in my, they're not something, they're not someone I'd be friends with. Like everyone is, every person has a lot of depth to them if you give them the time to like tell you an interesting story. And I think like before working on Dial Up, I was more quick to bucket people or make judgments about people that I would just meet. And this has really changed my perception on just like any human. Like I'm so much more eager to ask a total stranger 
questions about their life or sort of go around the in the world thinking that everyone is a good person to interview for your podcast. But I also, um, you know, a lot of people in dial up are kind of offline um, or like, yeah, like they're not on social media and stuff. And so I'm exposed to people like that. I would never run into. I got a tarot reading from someone in rural Alabama who does not use social media. I would never be in rural Alabama for any reason. Like, I really just, I don't think I would. Maybe I'd have to drive through it. But like, I would never otherwise meet her. And I also wouldn't necessarily run into her on the internet. And so like, with all these calls, I just feel like, wow, it's so special that I get exposed to this particular person and personality like this is like a this is a podcast just for me like no one else can hear it and I just feel like time spent with like humans that you cannot otherwise meet is just so special do you think part of why they're on dial-up but not on other social media is because it's like through a phone medium and they are more comfortable with that or it just feels less less weird for some reason I think it has to do with the way that they found out about dial-up. Dial-up had some, it spread in a strain. It actually spread a lot through TV news and radio, which I Ah. think reaches people that are not on Twitter, right? So like they found out about this new, like normally people find out about new apps from whatever's trending on Twitter or they read like tech, like about social networks, they read like tech crunch articles and stuff. Like, dial-up's been in pretty weird places. It was once, like, in print in Reader's Digest in Canada. So it got a (laughs) bunch of, like, you know, seven-year-old, like, Canadian ladies. But then it also was, like, on public radio in Ghana. And I think because of the, like, way it spread, it has reached people who, like, wouldn't normally flock to, like, whatever app is trending on social media because they're not even on social media. And, like, a lot of humans aren't on social media. (laughs) I know you were referring to these as podcasts just like metaphorically, but it would actually be a really interesting podcast if the people oh, yeah. were open to it. I've, I wish, I wish that I knew what was going on on these calls and could listen. I think there's like issues with, I mean, I debated this so many times. Like if you knew your calls recorded, that sort of changes the dynamic. For I sure. think some people would also not be okay with it. Just the idea of recorded phone calls feels creepy and weird. Mm-hmm. I think like calling them podcast mode phone calls makes more sense and people could opt into it. I've wanted to build out stuff like that, but I also know like the observe the observed self can act different. I mean, I'm not too different if I'm recorded or just talking to someone. But I think a lot of people get so nervous about it and then like wouldn't opt, wouldn't want to like be on a, on any sort of app that does something like that. But yeah, I mean, I think there's a way to balance it. I think in like the new thing that I built, that could be an option. Like if someone wanted to build a social experience where people are being matched in one-on-ones, but like it's very explicit. These are all recorded and then they're going to be woven into my already existing podcast. Like I'm going to have a podcast about grief and then I'm going to connect people who are experiencing grief. Your conversation will be recorded and we're going to share snippets in my next podcast episode, but it's going to be hosted on this app. Like that's fine. I think like as long as each section of it is like very explicit. Yeah. Setting the expectations up front and making sure people like it's extremely consensual and then you're definitely going to lose a lot of people, but I, it does seem like there's a way to do it, but I agree that you have to be very careful. Yeah, totally. I also, I get like a lot of written stories and I've tried to document that. And two people that met each other wrote a novel together. (laughs) These two these two people met and became sister. Like they uh, basically adopted each other as sisters. They're not actually blood related. It's someone in Spain and someone in the Netherlands and they talk every day and they thought it was so magical that they met that they wrote a book about like how this changed their life. And so like, that's a cool moment of documentation. But like, then I realized I'm probably missing a lot of stories because, you know, people wouldn't think to reach out to the app creator people might not want to translate their special experience into a work of art. And I do know like people are having really long phone calls and that's significant. If you're talking to someone for three hours, that must impact your life in some way. People will talk for three hours. And then after every call, you could like leave a note of how your call went and people will just write great. (laughs) 
<laughs> so helpful. So I know nothing. <laughs> for the people who were talking for 11 yeah. hours, I, I hope they got married yeah. or something. Some of it is romantic, but a lot of it isn't. And a lot of it's ephemeral too. Like you can talk to someone for five hours and you both may be, maybe it was super therapeutic. Maybe you both made all these discoveries during the call, but then is there necessarily a reason to stay in touch? Some people do, some people don't. Some people have flown out to meet each other, but then sometimes it's more like, this call was incredible and that was the experience itself. Like we both got a lot out of it, but we are so different. We're in different parts of the world. We're probably not going to be friends, but we had this moment where it hit us. The call hit us on a day where we were, had a shared mood and like maybe we were going through a similar issue and we worked on that together and that's it. Yeah, that's so cool. We, we're at time right now. Do you mind if we go 10 minutes over? That's fine. Okay, great. I just wanted to be respectful. So two last questions for you. So one is when you were talking about how everyone's interesting and if you just ask good questions, you're going to get to something really interesting. How do you get those stories out of people while also making them feel comfortable? I think asking people to backtrack like about how they got to where they are is like always interesting or to ask people how they feel about things, like asking people more emotional questions, even though that's actually like uncomfortable to do. I've been more interested in that because, you know, sometimes people will tell a story and then I'll ask like, well, like, how do you feel about this situation? I guess it's sort of like a therapist. <laughs> I think like when asking more detailed questions of more of like how and like, how does this affect you and how did this happen? Like that leads to more interesting stories. And then also like, I think I get exposed to... Owners, people have like live in interesting places and have crazy professions that I know nothing about. And I think that that leads to so many questions. That's how it feels like a podcast. I think early on in the pandemic, I was maybe like March of 2020 when people were like panic shopping. I matched with a security guard at a Dollar Tree in, I think in Michigan, and he was telling me how like, people were like ransacking the shop and people were like shoplifting and stuff. And this was before there were like even many articles about the panic shopping. And so I was kind of just like interviewing him, like what's going on in the world around you? Like, how does that relate to the pandemic? And so a lot of it feels like, you know, getting news firsthand. But then our conversation shifted to him telling me that he was about to turn 30 in a few days. So then we we're talking about like, how do you feel about turning 30? Like, what do you wish you had done differently in your 20s? Just like, I don't know, conversations go all over the place, but it's a mix of like personal emotions and then also like news about the world. And it's, you know, always a story that you will not read an article about. Yeah, and and in a certain way, more like representative of probably what's actually going on. Because a journalist, like jur journalists are only think to talk to the people who they think to talk to and sort of the, the tautological, but true. And so there's probably people they would never think to interview a security guard about his experience with COVID. Yeah, totally. And yeah, we also talked about how his hours had to be s slashed as well and that he was like worried about rent and all these things, which, you know, these stories could have articles if if they trend on Twitter. I mean, I think a lot of journalists just look for what's, they definitely look for real stories from real people in the moment, but that's often discovered through social media. And not everyone has that impulse to tweet about how they feel <laughs> or what's going on. Yeah. And they tend to have the impulse when it's the most extreme things or like weird things. So you're more likely to get very unrepresentative information. Um, compared to just some random experience where it's like, yeah, I'm gonna, it's going to be a little hard for me to pay rent this month and I'm a little worried about it, but I think I'll be able to pull it together. Like that's, that's not uh, the, the same kind of like thrilling story as someone who, you know, lost their life savings or something like that. So we're coming up on our time and I have just one last question. Mm -hmm. um, in in dial-up, have you noticed any unique norms in how people greet each other or say goodbye, considering that they may not know each other well or like don't know, at least don't expect that someone's going to initially pick up the phone that moment? Yeah. I mean, so there's some people that have you know been on dial-up for two years and so they've 
talk to 100 people and they're very seasoned dial-up users so they're definitely more smooth on the phone i think like the, the dial-up small talk at the beginning of the call is always like where do you live and like you know about the city that you're in sometimes about the weather you know basic small talk stuff often it's like who else have you talked to like who are other interesting people you've met but then after the initial 10 minutes it definitely gets deeper and you know lots of stories and the conversations go in so many different directions but it is weird at the end because it's like ephemeral and i also you know tell people not to share contact info because i don't want anyone to feel like it's a dating app i also don't want you know some conversations are meant to be ephemeral i also don't want to burden people with you know needing to stay in touch because it's annoying Uh, so i tell people not to share contact info Often they do, of course. They have a strong connection. They want to stay in touch. And people have flown out to meet each other. People have moved in with each other. All these things happen. But there is that moment at the end of the call you have to decide, like, do you want to keep this ephemeral or do you want to stay in touch? And it sometimes feels sad. Like, I don't know. It's a lesson on <laughs> ephemerality and just like, yeah, letting strange experiences into your life but not holding on to them too much. But yeah, there is that moment that if you've had a really intense emotional conversation, you don't know, like, should we do this again? Should I give you my number? What happens? And a lot of the times, <laughs> I guess I'll say this publicly, our app has bugs. So sometimes the call just disconnects people and they can never talk again. I mean, maybe they'll run into each other or if they email me, I can like try to reconnect them, but that's like a whole process and I can't always do it. And so sometimes you didn't even prepare to say goodbye, but you like you got disconnected and Of course, this is heartbreaking a lot of times, but some people actually love it because you just got this glimpse and this like fleeting moment and then the person is gone and there's all these mysteries left. It's sort of like a good end to a movie where it ends on a cliffhanger and you just kind of like wonder and you also don't have to like worry about then what do you do next? I could see that being a feature in of itself where you say something like, you know, I want this call to randomly be ended. It's like somewhere between like 60 and 90 minutes into this or something like that. And, you know, I won't know when. And so I'm going to like make the most of every moment in a different kind of way. Yeah. Yeah, Some people think that that is the feature. People will, you know, comment like, oh, you know, like the call ran out of like we ran out of the time. Like as though. (laughs) All calls are time because sometimes it happens roughly an, at an hour in. Like, but that's just random that it happened at an hour in. And it has to do with spotty Wi-Fi or there's many possible bugs. But people will be like, "Oh yeah, that's you know that's just how the app is," and they won't know that it's a bug. But it's definitely it's kind of cool because it sort of takes you out of the responsibility of like you know needing to decide whether or not you ever want to stay in touch with them. And it's more of like, oh well, we were like destined to talk to each other in this moment and experience this and that's it. I'm excited for people listening to this to be able to try it out and if they want to, to share their experience because it sounds like a really interesting set of social dynamics. I think that it is scary to people at first to actually pick up the phone, but it's definitely worth it once you get over actually saying hi and picking up like the calls will totally transport you. Well, thank you, Danielle. This was a really fun conversation. I feel like this one totally transported me. So I had I had a very <laughs> <Cool>. fun evening. <laughs> it was wonderful talking with you. If people want to learn more about you or your countless projects, where can they find you? I tweet a lot of stuff I'm working on. So I'm on Twitter at DJ Baskin. And then I have a website, daniellebaskin.com, which has links to many stunts and projects that we didn't even talk about. Truly so many. I really recommend going to Danielle's website and going through her Twitter because it just keeps going on and on. At some point I was like, is this a group of people? (laughs) Yeah, I've got like whiteboards of a a long list of things that I want to launch. Well, thank you so much, Danielle. Have a great rest of your day. Oh, thank you so much. 